namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambutasa namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambutasa namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambutasa Amongst the different kinds of meditation, there are three that are kind of have some overlapping uh, reference as um, Maranasati, which is contemplation of death, the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body is a form of Kayanasati, and um, Asuba meditation, which is meditation on the impermanence of the body through the contemplation of corpses. Maranasati, contemplation of death, is basically um, a uh, discipline of the mind to make the fact of impermanence real to yourself. Contemplate that I too shall die. You know, in our culture, we tend to try and avoid thinking about death, but the Buddha said you should often remind yourself that you're mortal, you will you will come to an end. Meditation on the 32 parts of the body is an examination of the constituents of the body, the organs and the fluids, to break up the sense of the body as a discrete compact unit, to see the kind of dependent and empty nature of the body and overcome self reference in the body. It also can help with diminishing sensual desire. But the particular meditation that has the strongest effect on diminishing sensual desire is uh, Asuba. Asuba is a uh, meditation that uh, looks at the body as impermanent in that it too is subject to destruction and decay. In ancient India, there were places called charnel grounds, which is where poor people who couldn't afford a uh, elaborate, proper Brahmanical funeral, which consumed a lot of wood for the cremation, they would just take the body out and lay it on on the ground and leave it and let it uh, decay there. And the Buddhist monks would go to the charnel grounds and contemplate the decaying bodies. To some degree, this is still possible to do in Thailand. Occasionally, families will donate a body to a monastery, particularly if the body is that of one who has died suddenly, especially by violence. Because the idea is if the body is cremated, the ghost will be confused. He died suddenly. He wasn't expecting to die. He doesn't really know he's dead. He's in a state of confusion. And if the body is destroyed, he loses that anchor. But if the body is still present and he sees the body as a ghost, that will shock him into realizing that he is actually dead and he'll be able to pass on and take a proper rebirth. At least that's the, the way the people think. So they'll donate a body to a monastery and uh, leave it in the forest. Um, I did see this done once. I was staying at Wat Khun. The abbot there was a uh, promoter of this uh, form of a suba meditation. And I only visited that monastery briefly for a period of you know, maybe two weeks. And while I was there, there was a body in the forest and the monks would had a schedule. You'd take a turn to go out by yourself to the forest and contemplate the body. The body was in a, a simple wooden coffin with a lid. You go out to the place and sit on a dais raised above the coffin and remove the coffin lid and place candles around the, the perimeter and just sit cross-legged on the dais and contemplate the body. I hadn't expected it to be such a powerful experience. It is quite moving to see a, a human body that's in a partial state of decay. It's not really accessible to get this object of meditation 
in the modern West, there are alternatives you can do to get some of the effect. Uh, one is simply using the imagination. There is in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, there is a description of this practice that uh, I'll read out because it's quite brief. Again, a monk, as if he were to see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, one or two or three days dead, bloated, discolored, festering, compares this body with that, thinking, this body is of the same nature. It will become like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Again, a monk, as if he were to see a corpse in a charnel ground, thrown aside, eaten by crows, hawks, or vultures, by dogs or jackals, or various other creatures, compares this body with that, thinking this body is of the same nature. It will become like that. It is not exempt from that fate. Again, a monk, as if he were to see a corpse in a charnel ground, thrown aside, a skeleton with flesh and blood, connected by sinews. A fleshless skeleton, smeared with blood, connected by sinews. A skeleton detached from flesh and blood, connected by sinews. Randomly connected bones scattered in all directions. A hand bone here, a foot bone there, a shin bone there, a thigh bone there, a hip bone there. A spine here, a skull there, compares this body with that. Again, a, monk's if he, a monk, if he were to see a corpse in a charnel ground thrown aside, the bones whitened, looking like shells. The bones piled up a year old. The bones rotted away to powder. Compares this body with that. Thinking this body is of the same nature, will become like that, is not exempt from that fate. So that description has uh, what are called the nine stages of the decay of the body. So you can, uh, you can reference that, although you don't necessarily have to follow the exact stages precisely one one method is to use your imagination that you are in a charnel ground in india and it's it's night it's moonlit and the people come carrying a, a corpse and it's covered in a cloth and they lay it down and they do some chanting whatever the little ceremony and then they walk away you go over and approach the body and lift the, the the sheet to look underneath and you it's your face you see yourself so you can looking at your dead body from outside and then imagine it going through the stages of decay at first it looks it looks uh, you know stiff but peaceful and then it gradually becomes repulsive looking it bloats and changes color becomes blue fluids ooze out of cracks and then it actually becomes for a while it becomes rather violent you have maggots crawling out gnawing on it you have crows and dogs coming and biting at it then you have all these scattered bones and then the the groundskeeper comes at some point he rakes the bones up into a pile and the bones are baked by the sun and they gradually wither, they dry out and crack and turn to dust. And finally, there's a little pile of dust and a wind comes and blows it away. So it ends, the end of the contemplation is a peaceful one. You know, it's, it's, it's the wind puffing away the, the dust and it's all gone, it's emptiness. So you can run that, that kind of, uh, again, this is an anusati, like uh, we spoke about the, uh, previous uh, talk uh, uh, it's an exercise using your visualization and your imagination run through the decaying stages of the body the references to your own body that your own body is not free from that that your body will be subject to that another uh, way of using this on occasion we don't really have easy access to dead human bodies but uh, you often see dead animals you can see animals killed by the side of the road or you know in many kind of situations you'll see a, a dead animal and you can stop when you see one and just contemplate for a few minutes the nature of the body to decay and, and break up 
and always referencing it back to my own body is not exempt from that, is not free from that. Yeah. Now, there should be a, a word of caution because this is a strong medicine and uh, it is possible to overdo it to become, you know, the the goal is not to become morbidly obsessed with, with, uh, with death and, and decay, but to shake yourself from the delusion of the body being permanent and beautiful to see it in its nature as a compounded thing subject to destruction. It happened in the Buddhist time that he taught this meditation to a group of monks, and then he went into retreat for two weeks. And the monks, after he was not supervising them, they overdid this meditation and became, some of them developed a strong aversion to the body and wanted to rid themselves of this this body and committed suicide. As it says, they took the knife and committed suicide. So then the, the Buddha, on learning this, he told the monks to start doing mindfulness of breathing instead because there's no, no harm can come of mindfulness of breathing. So this is a caution to, you know, you can, don't be afraid of trying this meditation, but don't become... I wouldn't advise you to make it your main practice or to you know overdo it, but particularly if you find yourself being obsessed with thoughts of sensual desire, then this contemplation is a very good antidote to that and bring you back to a, a middle point, a point of balance where you're at peace with the with the body, but you're not, not swinging to the other end and becoming totally disgusted and averse by the body. That's taking it too far. So um, that was the, the main theme of my talk, but now I'll, I think I'll uh, say a few words briefly about the other two meditations I mentioned. Uh, Marana Sati, Contemplation of Death, is something the Buddha said that we should do often. He said you should remind yourself every day that you're going to die. And the whole point of that is just to remind yourself, I too am subject to death. And in Vasudhi Magga, there's a long list of ways of bringing up this, uh, this contemplation. One is to think that all you know for sure is that you are going to die. You don't know when, you don't know where, you don't know how. One is to think that no one, no one ever has escaped from death, and why should you be a special case? And the Vasudhi Magga goes into a long list of kind of subgroups, like even great kings like um, Ahsoka and uh, Bimbisara died. You know, how can you, a humble person, escape? And uh, even uh, really wise persons like Mughalana and Sariputta died, how can you escape? And one one of these uh, categories that I found kind of um, extra poignant in a way was it said, even the famous, even ones of great fame and renown, and it lists a bunch of names, and you have to, would have to be a specialist in Indian history to recognize any of them now, and uh, maybe some of them nobody really knows who they are. So even their fame has perished. You know, they were at Buddha Gosa's time they were, it would be like saying like nowadays it would be be like saying Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe, famous people that everybody knows, they died. But now these names are even forgotten. So all human existence is impermanent and uh, we need to just remind ourselves of that. People avoid facing the fact of their death. I, I recall one uh, one time when um, one of our senior monks gave a public talk about impermanence and the reality of, of death, and 
after the talk, there was this uh, woman who was, at the time, she was in her 90s. She was like 95 or something like this. And she came up to Ajahn after and she said, that was such a powerful talk, Ajahn. It made me really think, one day I might die. <laughs> so, you know, this is, uh, you know, people, uh, people don't, don't look at that, that reality. But that marnasati is not intended to overcome sensuality. It's intended to bring out a, a sense of uh, making permanence real to yourself. The other meditation is the contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. This is a meditation that does diminish sensuality, but that's not really the, the primary purpose of it. It can be used for that and it's safer than you know, a Subha meditation. It's, it's a meditation you can do at any time, to any degree. But its strongest benefit is to overcome a sense of identification with the body because we tend to see the body as a compact unit and we see it from the outside. So we have a, a distorted view of the body. We don't see it in its totality. So we're trying to change the perception of the body. So there's a traditional list you can find in many places of 32 parts of the body. It begins with hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. Hair of the head and hair of the body are two different words in Pali and also in Thai. So those are the five external signs. Then it goes through the various organs like heart, liver, lungs, intestines, and fluids like uh, snot, spittle, blood urine so you're looking at all the parts of the body and the the way that's recommended to do this is to go through the list in the forward order go through the list as found 32 parts one after the other and then do it in the reverse order and doing it backwards and taking just a a, a short while with each part and visualizing it and trying to you know see it in your mind's eye, the bones or the guts or the blood. And then at the end, you um, choose one part that stood out for you that was easy to visualize, and you just spend some time sitting with that one part, visualizing it. So then at that point, it becomes a samatha meditation, and you can actually take that all the way to jhana. So that's a very brief coverage of those two, but my main theme today was the, uh, the Subha meditation. <laughs>